And hello and welcome to Casting Workbooks, new live stream AMA series. Hi everyone, I'm Christopher Bennett. Uh, our new live stream series, it's gonna be a weekly series that we've done. We're putting this out there for actors. Um, this is something where, you're, where we wanna get you in front of the top casting directors in the business and offer you an opportunity to engage from with them, to hear from them, to really understand uh, that aspect of the business and the important role they play and how they approach the work as they interface with so many of you day-to-day uh, in, -day in what you do as, as actors. Today's guest is Paul Weber, uh, a longtime friend of Casting Workbook. Paul began his career as an actor himself. He's a graduate of ASU and on an acting scholarship, he fell in love with acting. That was his first love. He, he eventually toured and across several theater companies all over the US, including the California Shakespeare Festival and the Arizona Theater Company. Then he went and he moved to LA. That's where he met the acclaimed casting director and author, Michael Shirtliff. Uh, Michael mentored Paul and gave him new insight into the approach of the audition process. A really, really important thing to understand where he studied it, meticulously read about it, worked really hard with Michael. And through that experience, he became an experienced and dedicated acting coach as well. He started working with groups of actors, one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching settings, any opportunity where he could get two actors and help teach and convey this passion that he has for that audition process and for the work of acting. That's kind of his second love, and we're gonna get into that as well. Uh, in workshops, private groups. 20 years later, he's been one of the most in-demand casting directors around the world with some major studios, major networks, so many television series and features that he's done, most recently with MGM as an in-house casting director and executive. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to our first live stream AMA, Mr. Paul Weber. Paul, thank you so much for doing our show today and welcome. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in. This is Actually, my very first live stream. Um, so I'm really excited about this. It's like um, going on stage for opening night. So bear with me if I get a little bit nervous, right? All of you guys know that feeling, but thank you so much for having me. You look great, old friend, and it's great to see you. Thank you very much for doing it. Um, I, I want to jump right into it because we have got a ton of questions. And there's a lot of people that, that really want to get some time with you. My, my first question, and I think the most obvious one is, what are you doing right now? It's an interesting time. What, what are you doing to keep busy? What, are, what, what projects might you be working on with everything that's going on around you? How's that going? Well, there are now some green shoots starting to pop up. I just had several conversations with international producers that I work with, uh, ready to just step into green lighting projects that we, are, they are, we already have financed. We are ready to go. We were ready to go. So I think people are, we're looking beyond the crisis of what's happening right now. Um, so so I, I try to maintain a, a really positive uh, point of view. You know, the world as we knew it sort of stood still and blew up at the same time. Um, and there's so much fear and anxiety out there. And actors, I know all of us, and especially actors are sort of, um, intimately acquainted with that yeah. fear and anxiety, right? And insecurity. So, you know, perhaps we're all a little more resilient for it. Same, you know, that it's been traumatic. It's been stressful. It, it's been rough. But having positive conversations with people that I work with uh, has been um, has been, you know, a blessing uh, for me because I know that we're beginning to see that in a short period of time, we will find our way out of this and to begin preparing for that now. I think that's a great perspective. I appreciate that, Paul. Um, you and I have talked before, and I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the casting director, and in particular, the profession that I think is, there's not nearly enough that is, is known or understood. And I think w the more we can do to help actors connect and understand how you work, because so many casting directors understand the craft of acting, many of them come uh, as actors themselves. My next question is, will you look at talent, will you look at actors who don't have representation? Do you look at them as seriously? Does it matter to you? Have you got an opinion on all that? And do you find that you are, uh, at odds with your industry colleagues in that respect? Or what's your approach and perspective on non-represented talent and rep talent? Will I look at unrepresented actors? Yes. Yep. 
Um, will I look at them as seriously as represented actors? It depends, right? Um, does it matter? Well, sure it matters. I'm not saying that if you are not represented, you're not a talented actor. What I am saying is that, that I think it is helpful and all actors are striving toward the goal of having a really good agent because an agent, an actor with an agent has just greater access to casting directors, right? And agents are uniquely positioned to, to uh, promote and, 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 and pitch actors to casting. And we trust agents for the most part, you know, we, and we rely upon, you know, their, their judgment and uh, their understanding of the actor and how to pitch to us. So um, uh, I think it's really important to eventually have an agent. And, but the truth is most actors, when they first start out, don't have an agent. I didn't when I first started out. And it was, it was challenging. Um, and when I started, there were really only four American networks. And the only way we could really get in front of casting directors was through maybe uh, uh, casting workshops, doing plays, um, uh, recommendations by acting teachers, um, referrals from other actors. Uh, that's how actors who are looking to get in the game and try to get an agent, I, I recommend that, that you can do those things. But now there are just so many more opportunities and strategies, right, to make casting aware of, of your talents that just didn't exist before. Um, right. And, and most of you know what that is, and that uh, has a lot to do with, with being savvy in social media um, engagement. You know, um, platforms now exist that are out there where you can write, produce, direct, star in your own stories. You know, there's, there's YouTube, um, Instagram, there's uh, TikTok, there's short films. Right, yeah. There's um, uh, webisode series and festivals and, I mean, that's where we are finding actors. And, you know, I just finished uh, a little while ago working on a project where I cast a lead in a television movie that was initially discovered on YouTube and really? had very few film and television credits. And I, and I suspect she probably got her agent by doing this YouTube project that put her on the map. So she was able to get an agent by doing something uh, on social media. And, and now, you know, she did the movie and she was a virtual unknown. Now she's starring in um, a series on Fox with Jay Baruchel and, and Dennis um, Leary. So, so that's, that's why I think it's an awful good time, in spite of what we're going through now, to get yourself out there so that you can get an agent. That's insightful, and I appreciate that, Paul. On that same vein, um, tell me more, a little bit more about that. Um, we want to know, how do you advise an actor right now who doesn't have an agent, who really wants to get into the room and audition for you, wants to get in front of a top casting director? In your estimation, is that even possible? How likely or how common do you, do you see that happen, if at all? I, I do. Now, I work on union projects and most union projects that I work on, I work with agents on. However, I will field phone calls from agents who have seen someone in a show that haven't quite signed them yet and they want me to take a look at them. I will see theater looking for opportunities for talent um, that I may not be familiar with who do not have um, agents. I talk to cast, I talk to other casting directors. I also um, am in very close contact with acting teachers everywhere, including Los Angeles, of course. And I will call them occasionally and, and say, listen, I'm having a little trouble here, or it's a specific kind of role. Is there anyone really special that may not, it doesn't matter if they don't have an agent yet. If there's someone who's got uh, talent and you think I should know about, I'd like to meet them or I'd like them to submit something to me online. So there are lots of different avenues now that actors can become 
can, can get on that radar with the casting director. And then that, ra that radar allows us to know who that actor is. And many times I will call an agent and say, listen, it works the other way. I'll say, you know, I just saw this actor. He's not represented. He's very talented. And I've done this before. Would you take a meeting with him? Not as a favor, but because I think you will really, really appreciate this talent. And if you don't yeah. sign him, it's not because he's not talented or she's not talented. It's because you already have a roster that has maybe those actors already on your list. Um, and Paul, I wanted that to- help? That, that, no, that's great. And actually, I want to stay there for one minute because I got a great question that came in from Karen in London. And it, it's really on that, that, that same topic. Uh, Karen's an actor from London and she wants to know, does having a certain agent whoever that might be, does it ever factor into your decision-making, whether you'll consider you, you want to see this actor or not? Um, how important or how uh, detrimental or, or, or helpful can the right agent be to who you'll look at? Do, do you factor it in at all? Sure, I do. Um, absolutely. Uh, casting directors have relationships with agents, so we will trust their judgment. There are agencies that are larger than other agencies who have a certain level of clientele. So it's a bit naive to say that, gosh, I just, um, I have a couple of uh, featured parts on a TV show. I want to sign with a major agency like CAA or ICM or, or WME or UTA or one of the major agencies. And in every uh, country, you know who those major agencies are. We won't go we only go to those agencies for some of the lead roles, the larger roles, the big guest star roles. And we will look for smaller roles, especially when actors are just starting out. We will give opportunities. I think I speak for my peers too. We will offer opportunities to actors with smaller agencies for smaller roles. And that's just how it works. And it works that way in most businesses as well too. That you know, some of the top talent is going to be with the larger agencies for the larger roles. Some of the Got smaller it. emerging talent will be signed by smaller agencies and managers first. They will fight like hell to try to get them, those actors in front of us. And that's where we give actors breaks. And that's where actors break out to the next level. And perhaps they leave that other agent behind and move up to a larger agency at some point. I know that breaks the heart of a lot of managers and smaller <laughs> agents that they leave them eventually, sure, but it's sure. what happens sometimes. You, you had mentioned, Paul, that uh, you, you often work on union projects. Uh, Lana wants to know, will you even consider a non-union actor if you're in casting for a union project? Yes, I will, depending on the role. Now that's how an actor gets in the union, that's how an actor gets represented, by having a break, by me seeing them right out of acting school, let's say, and bringing them in for a project, because I've seen their work, let's say, in a showcase. I bring them in, the producers like them, we decide to give them a union card, all of a sudden, um, an agent might be interested because I might call them and say, I just saw this really amazing actor, we just hired him, why don't you take a meeting with him? That's, it's all about relationships, Christopher, and that's why I really urge actors to create as much of, um, uh, of an ongoing relationship with everyone in the industry, because it's quite a collaborative um, enterprise for all yeah, of us, Yeah, of course, right? of course. Uh, talking to Mr. Paul Weber, casting director based in Los Angeles, uh, an incredible career. If you're just logging in now, welcome to our live stream, Ask Me Anything with Paul Weber. Uh, Paul, that's some really insightful stuff. I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about auditions. I want to dive into that for a little bit. Uh, you have got a, a tremendous amount of experience and, a, and an appreciation, if not a passion for the audition. There, it is really a, a, there's a science and an art to it, as we've talked about. You teach courses and workshops on it. You work with actors. You've worked with some of the best. I, I talk to actors all the time. I think, you, you know, with the exception of my immediate family, I, 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 there's no other group I spend more time with than actors. And the audition is on their mind. And one of the things that comes up all the time is, how do I go in there and really stand out? How do I get the attention of that casting director? They want to do something memorable. They want to really get the part. When you are looking at an actor in that audition process, when you're wearing your casting director hat, 
What's your advice on how they can be bold and they can approach the audition a certain way to leave an impression without necessarily compromising their chance to actually get the part? Have you got any advice around that and, and, and the best way to stand out in an audition? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's a question we get a lot. And it's just not enough to say I like actors who are prepared and give make bold choices. You hear that all the time. So, so maybe let's just, let's flip the question a little bit. Sure. It's, it's like, it's maybe what keeps actors from doing their best work in the audition room, right? And I find that a lot of actors just get in their own heads. They, they get in their own way when they're auditioning. And they're often paralyzed by, by fear of rejection or anxiety and, 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 you know, that just piggybacks on itself. Right. So, you know, I, I find that a lot of that fear and anxiety can be managed by, by how an actor prepares for that audition. Um, which is after all, what the actor's job is primarily getting, the job is great, but they will be an audition process. You guys will all be auditioning many more times more likely than you will be getting the job. So the better the preparation, the more assured and confident the actor is, not only, you know, in the choices they make, but the freedom that they now have to, to execute the direction they might get from a casting director or producer, if they're lucky. Um, and of course, the more an actor gets a chance to audition or self-tape audition, the better they're going to get at it, just like anything. So my advice is you get better by auditioning, by getting out there and auditioning and doing the work and audition for everything you can. Short films, student films, plays, do classes, practice, practice, right. you know, sacrifice. It's repetition, more. yeah. Um, uh, that's my advice, really, because there's no one note I can give an actor to to say, give me a bolder choice. You know, the actor comes in with their toolbox, born of their preparation, born of the technique that they have developed. And everyone starts off pretty green. You know, they may not, I may see someone who's brand new, but there's an instinct. There's There's a willingness to be present. There's a willingness to be vulnerable. There's a willingness to, to listen. Um, those are really important things, and that's what sometimes doesn't happen because actors are so desperate and sometimes get in their own head and they sabotage their own work. If they just did the work and continued to do the work, they would get better at it, and then they might even enjoy it. That's what that's I'd so, love to see. That's so, actors that's so auditioning, that, right? That is, that is so important. Um, Linda wants to know, right along that line, is there a, a, a thing that, that, that happens? Is there something that the actor has any control over when they want to create that moment um, so that you really go, aha, there it is. That's the one we were looking for. And I think this is where we're really getting into the art or the science of the casting and the audition. Is, is there any of that within their control as you see it? What, tell me a little bit more about that. That's fascinating stuff. Yeah, it really is. And it's, it's very psychological too. You can do the work and, and really that's all the control you have. And I know a lot of your actors, the actors out there know this, but you really need to know it from us that the only control you have is what you bring into the room, your state of being, your preparedness, your willingness to listen, to take direction, to be present. You really have no control over anything else. And anytime you think you do, you will start to second guess and sabotage yourself. You'll leave the room and wonder what you could have done differently. But if you're present in that moment, we will see it. We will know that you're doing the work that you are best capable of doing in that moment. And that's really what you leave us with. So don't worry about the other stuff because you can't do anything about it anyway. You can't change your height. You can't necessarily change your weight in a week or when we're gonna shoot in two days. You can't change your diversity, your nationality, your look. There may be a whole room of actors who look very much like you, right? Sure. Coming in from the same role. There may be a whole room of actors who don't look anything like you. When you start getting in your own head and second guessing that, you're gonna be in trouble. So 
do the work, prepare, realize if you're sitting in that green room waiting to go into the casting director's office, you're there for a reason. Don't second guess, oh, I'm not good enough. I sh why should, he's better looking, she's better looking, you know, uh, uh, and all of a sudden, everything you prepare. Like you say, up. they get in their own heads. They get in their own heads. That's right. The, That's right. Uh, uh, Michael's got a great question that came in just before that, and, and you've touched on it a little bit. Let's talk a bit about accents. Uh, uh, would love to know your opinion on that. We've got a multicultural industry. We have so much diversity, probably more than ever before in the business and across it. A lot of actors want to know, Paul, what's your take on do I bring my accent into the audition with me or not? Often the, the, the accent could be at odds with the character. What's your advice to actors? Should they be trying to fool you and go right into character as the sides might require? Or do you say, don't worry about it. Let's see what you can do as an actor first and work on it off camera. What's your thinking around accents in the audition? Okay, that's a really, really good question. Um, and uh, I, th I think it depends you know, if you're uh, a Commonwealth actor from the English speaking countries as well, or if you are from um, Europe or-, or Yeah, let's, let's go British on this one. I think the question was geared towards a British accent, but uh, your thoughts on all of it, yeah. Okay, um, if you're coming in for a role as a British actor for an American part, I pray that you're really good with an American accent. Right. And I think it's easier for Canadian, certainly Canadian, but European uh, Commonwealth actors, you see even South Africa, Britain, um, Australia, come in with your American accent, because that's how you are going to uh, perform your audition, right, is in an American accent. And if you're really good at it, we won't know. I might, but my producers likely may not. And you talk to us, maybe a little bit of chit chat before, not too much, but, uh, and then right when you're ready to get into the audition, if it's an American part without an accent, you do a spot on American accent. At the end of that, shift to your British accent. Then it's like, oh my God, that guy's like amazing. He's like Houdini, he's like David Copperfield. He was able to do an American accent brilliantly. And then he just shifted effortlessly to his native, uh, accent and and we even think you know he must be even a better actor than we thought or or she was because she was able to do that so i, I hope that answers the question yeah. if you cannot do a really spot on american accent for an american role don't try because all we'll be listening for is that one vowel in that one sentence and and it'll sound not like an american and and I'll be looking for it, my ear will be tuned for it, and the producers will too, and we'll be more aware of the accent slipping rather than the work being done. Uh, Paul, let's talk about sides for a minute. Let's talk about the lines. Let's talk about going off script. What's your advice to actors who are wondering, can they take that audition for a little bit of a walk. What do you, when you're in the audition room, see when an actor does that? Do you advise them to just stay on script or is that a necessary part of, of really letting their ability to perform it and bring the character to life essential? What, what's your advice on actors wondering how off script they can go and do you ever advise it? I say again, it depends, right? Sure. It, it really does on on the script itself, on the content, on the director, on the writer who's often in the room. Some actors or some directors I've worked with are very improvisation, right? Um, I had a chance to work with the great Robert Altman who directed Nashville and, and, Cape and Mr. Miller, one of the most iconic American directors Robert yeah. Altman. this or any generation. And he almost worked exclusively with actors improvisationally. And when you watch his movies, you see that too. But in the audition room, he worked improvisationally with that. So they didn't even read the script, many of them. Um, and some directors uh, encourage that kind of flexibility, you know, and creativity in, in, the, in the test. But, but others like William Shakespeare or, like, or Aaron Sorkin, let's say, you know, you don't friggin' touch one word of that script. You do not go off script. So I guess my general advice to actors is just stick to the script. You know, if you make it your own, it will feel fresh. It'll feel organic. It'll feel original. 
Got it. Uh, talking to Paul Weber, uh, casting director based in Los Angeles, uh, a great career. I mean, you've worked with Robert Altman, as, as we just talked about, uh, one of the most acclaimed directors ever. You've, you've done some really, really interesting and great work over the years, Paul. I would love to know right now, and a lot of people had a, a similar question, of all the projects that you've cast in, in your history, have you got any particular ones that stand out to you as, I'm going to use this word carefully, it's the most challenging, uh, not ones that you, that you loved the most or you didn't um, love the most, but, but a challenging project where you went, this isn't going to be easy to cast. And how did you approach that? Uh, you, yeah, hell, they were all easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. That's good to know. Um, no, they are, uh, they are all very challenging, I find. And, and why? I hope I why? Tell me about that. Why? Well, I mean, they're all challenging in different ways. I, I think, you know, I, I did a, worked as uh, the American casting director on the team that cast Spartacus, let's say. Great which show. Did, um, which was uh, among the most challenging um, and rewarding experiences because of what was demanded of the actors in the audition room and on set. I mean, First of all, it's a period piece, right? Um, it had mythical scale, yeah. right? Yeah. There was a language that was rather formal and sort of original. It was sort of Shakespearean, but the writers created a whole sort of mythical, classical language on its own. There were fighting skills that were necessary. There was even nudity for some characters that, that the actors had to sign on for. Um, we had to recast the lead, tragically. Um, so I remember, there were I remember. a lot of challenges, but oh my gosh, immensely rewarding. And I, I think we got it right. There's maybe one more example. This was uh, some years ago, we were shooting an anthology series in Vancouver called The Outer Limits. And it was a seven season run for an anthology series where I had to cast name lead actors in every single original story, every single week. All the other actors were cast out of Vancouver, but I had to cast the American or Canadian counterpart lead actors. So that was challenging and rewarding too, because you know I got to launch or help launch some young television medium. So, you know, actors like uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and, and Ryan Reynolds and, you know, Thora Birch and Neil Patrick Harris and um, Catherine O'Hara, you know, Canadian yeah. actress, James Marsden, Josh Jackson, another wow. Canadian actor, Nathan Fillion, you know, Barry Pepper, uh, Molly Parker, Charlton Heston, I got to do our, our finale. You're kidding. So that's really challenging and really gratifying. You know, some are more fun than others. Um, uh, some are easier than others. Um, but it, for me, it, it's, it's about collaboration. And when I work with uh, producers who, who are fun to work with, who are very creative, and a kind of a shout out to a couple of them in Toronto that I worked with, one half hour um, called Crawford and another hour long called Pure. And they were wonderful Canadian series with incredibly collaborative producers. And they were fun and in a way kind of easy because we were right on the same wavelength. And I was able to recommend a couple of actors and they said, let's do it. We got them signed off for and they're on set the next week. So sometimes the process is a little bit easier, but I think they're all challenging and we always anticipate that they are going to, each of them have their own um, special challenges. When you approach it, Paul, I think there's certainly, um, and as, as actors, of course, understand there's so much that goes into a, a, a project from the pre-production, the writing, um, all the way through to, to, to how we're going to market and position this. But the casting, you can, it's always, always about the casting, the ability to bring those characters to life and find the actors that are going to be able to do that and really connect with the audience. It's, it's absolutely essential. Um, which one are you most proud of in your career? Have you got one where you went, here's a great example, and, and how did you do, why are you so proud of it? How, why do you think that this was a particular great example of when casting gets it just right, you have something magic that happens? Well, uh, aside from, um, <clears throat> you know, Spartacus and, and um, 
and some of these other shows I've referenced. You know, you know, there's a series I worked on. It was basically three series as well. Two, they were the Stargate series. They ran for cumulative 17 years. Huge, yeah. You know? And so, they're still going, man. That is a still a massive. Yeah, uh, it, you know, it was, they were fun and great people to work with, and and um, I wish I had residuals on those shows. You just got a lot of shout outs from our audience at home on Stargate. Oh my God, that just yeah. lit the whole board up. <laughs> well, I was you know launched a lot of actors in Canada as well too because we shot there, and um, and you know what was challenging is we were told, listen, this is a franchise. We may have a series that will run each series seven to 10 years. So we need to find the actors who are going to grow with the audience and continue to be fresh for that audience. And the characters will continue to grow. So even when we're auditioning, I'm looking, am I gonna wanna watch this actor for the next five, seven, 10 years? And you, th you think about that, you approach it I that do. way. Wow. I do, I think about, you know, and you can't always predict, you don't know what's going to happen, but right. you kind of look at the well, the, the creative well of that actor, and you think, okay, this is the first episode, it's the pilot, and, and I assume our writers and directors are going to move the, the story forward, and it's going to get darker, or it's going to get deeper, it's going to get challenging for that character, and as the character grows, is that actor going to be able to continue to find, you know, the wealth of, of, of character choices? under the skin that will keep us engaged. And most of the best actors in the series that last for seven, 10 years, we are invested as an audience. So I, I do think about that. Uh, you know, I love all my children, you know, all of course. the projects, but you know, I guess most recently I had a chance to cast and co-produce um, a feature that we shot in um, outside of Toronto called The Curse of Buckout Road. And for me, that was very gratifying because I was able to not only put together a cast, but also be involved in the creative process uh, of attaching a director, attaching the writer, developing the script, working with really good actors, really good producers. And for me, as a, to grow, not only as a casting director, but into, onto the next level, you know, I thought that was really, um, a really sure. gratifying um, experience for me. And we're developing our next couple of movies as well and i really look forward to that because we all want to grow not only in our own craft but but perhaps in other areas of the business that we are um curious and interested about and now i think is a really good time to be an actor because you can do these things uh, paul the the audition happens the actors give it their best they leave the room uh, phone calls are made to agents conversations are had notes are given sometimes they're not given there's a whole component of this experience that I'm not sure actors necessarily are aware of or they think about. And sometimes the casting director really thinks they've found the right person, the right fit for that part. And sometimes the network, uh, the studio, the producers don't agree. It, in your experience, and I'm sure this has happened o over the years with you, have you ever had to fight for an actor um, where you really, really believe that they were right for the part, even if it didn't necessarily match up with, with the, the other uh, partners in the project? What's that like? How often does it happen? Talk to me about what it's like uh, when you've had to fight for actors you really believed in for a certain part. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a hired gun, right? So, so I, again, it depends on the relationship you have, the trust level you have with your bosses, your network, your your directors, your producers. I mean, I give an example. I I, don't, I hope he won't mind me talking about this, but you know, uh, Jason Momoa comes to mind. I've as, heard of him. I've heard of him. Yeah, maybe a little more than you did some years ago, but right. um, but at the time he he was relatively new and. Um, and I'm, I'm talking in terms of the series I cast, Stargate Atlantis, which was the second of our trilogy of Stargates. And, and when I read the script, he was the one and only, the first and only actor that I actually thought of. And I went, Jason Momoa would be great for this, would be great for this. And my producers, once they met him and, and were introduced to him and, and he read, they really loved him. And they loved his physicality, of course, too. But the network wasn't sold on him when he tested. Now it looks like, oh my gosh, 
how could you even doubt that Jason Momoa, but at the time he was, he was a bit green and a bit nervous and testing for a sort of an iconic show that could run, it ran seven years, but it could run seven, 10 years or more. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure. So the network wasn't quite sold and we did have to fight for him. Um, and you win a few, you lose a few. Um, but I feel, and I'm so glad we did fight for him. Right. Yeah, yeah. Watch him to Game of Thrones and beyond that, of course, too. But, you know, if I feel an actor is right, um, I will absolutely be their advocate. I will I'll go to the mat for them. I will, I will woo, I'll cajole, I'll plead, I'll beg to give them one more chance. And then it just, I can go only so far. Of course, certain. right. Yeah, of course. And then it's really not, it's not my air time. It's not my money. It's not my network. Um, ultimately, it's a collaborative process. I will do the best I can. And then uh, ultimately will be the decision of the director and, and producer. So casting directors, I think overall, all of us are actors advocates. We're not your adversary. You know, we're there to really help you and nurture you um, and try to get the best work you can. Because if you look good in the room, we look good. That's why I prep for testing purposes. When I test actors for network shows, we go into a quiet place and every single actor that tests, I work with for an hour before we go in the next day for that, just to make sure they're really comfortable. And I try to give them as many of the what ifs that can happen in the room so that they are as prepared as they can be. Uh, talking to Paul Weber, uh, certainly a, a great casting director, but also, as you said, an advocate in the room for actors, as, as so many of your colleagues are. I want to jump to some questions here, Paul, some rapid fire, some short answer ones. There are so many coming through and, and uh, a lot of people want to thank you, first of all, for doing this. This is really great. And, and you are, we are sending you the love virtually here. I hope you're feeling it. They appreciate it. Uh, I've got a great question here from Jessica. She's in the UK and she wants to know, um, is it still worth a UK actor even reaching out to, to a casting director like you or, or, or another one? Um, in general, if, if they don't yet even have the O-1 visa, I mean, like so many international actors and certainly in the UK, they want to come over and be a part of the business here in North America. Um, do you get into, do you worry about that or what's your advice if they don't have the O-1 visa yet? Because I work on international projects, Christopher, and I coach and train and travel and teach in a, a number of international uh, markets, I do tell actors that it's really important to have a body of work and an O-1 visa, if possible, before coming to the United States. Develop, if you're not getting hired in, in London, right now, which is a quite a, a good market. Uh, uh, and there's more and more diversity casting going on there. Now, several years ago, there wasn't as much diversity casting going on international, especially in London. So actors were frustrated and really good actors felt like they needed to come to the US, like Idris Elba is you know, uh, an example. Sure. A lot of actors, British actors of, of, of diverse backgrounds coming to the States. So there are always exceptions. However, I think it's really important to develop your skill set, develop uh, a resume to the point where you might qualify for an O-1 visa. And the only reason I would say for any foreign actor to come to the United States is to train, sure. is to immerse yourself in an American uh, approach to film and television acting. I'm, I'm talking film and television. I'm not talking theater, which I love, but I'm talking about becoming uh, as prepared as you can be in film and television technique. You, in many instances, I don't think can find better training than in Los Angeles or New York with some of the best teachers who teach that. Come over for three to six months if you can afford it. Can I, can I ask you a question on that? I got a great question from Javid. Yeah. Javid wants to know, on, on the same line there of, of the training, can you tell when an actor has had whether it's audition training or any kind of formal uh, acting coaching whatsoever in the audition room, uh, is it obvious to you? What, what's your take on that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I can look at a resume, right? And see where they've trained and studied. So um, <clears throat> I can, 
I can usually tell if there's a, are you talking about like a classically theater trained actor? Not necessarily. A lot of, a lot of actors out there have got, uh, you know, a formal film and television acting background training or education. Uh, some might come from stage. Some have none at all. And the question that Javid wants to know is, can you tell, you know, all things being equal in that moment, it does, is it really obvious to you? And I think what they're also underlying asking is how important is education to their career in your perspective? Yes. Okay, really, really good question. Thanks for that. Um, I guess from the years I've been doing this and my instinct is, and of course, maybe looking at a resume as well too, I can usually tell mm -hmm. um, an actor who is trained, whether it's classically or technique for film and television, um, they're, usually, they're usually in touch with their, their voice. They're usually in touch with their physicality. They're usually in touch with their emotional ability to access and express themselves effectively um, in an audition room and on set. And that does come with training. It does come with practice, like anything. However, there are exceptions. Sometimes, you know, we, we've talked about um, actors um, who, uh, just who got don't it. have a yeah, who right. Just right. Had no training. Yeah. You know. So it's, it, it can happen. It can happen it for sure. Can happen, but you know, my first boss once said to me when I started in casting, "God does not always give with both hands." You know, you don't just always get it. You know, the looks, the talent, the the opportunity, the luck. You don't always get it at the same time, and sometimes you don't get it at all. You get one or the other. So. The more prepared you are, the more trained you are, the more experienced you are, the more likely that it doesn't matter about all those things aligning at the same time. It doesn't necessarily even matter that you have this God-given great talent. It means that you're working, getting better, and the more you work at it, the more likely we are to take notice. That gets you in the room. That gets you a callback. That eventually should get you a job. Uh, lots of questions coming in here, Paul, about sides. I want to jump to these rapid fire ones for you here. A ton of them coming in about sides. Got a great one here from David. Uh, David really would love you to help break the myth here about sides. He wants to know about sides in the audition. Should actors be holding them or should they have them completely memorized? What do casting directors think of that? What's your reaction to, to when an actor has got to hold their lines? Okay. Every casting director is a little different. I used to think when I first started, oh my God, you, you don't have your sides memorized? You know, I came from a theater background. So of course, when you come in to perform, to audition, you wanna be off book. I've changed on that. It doesn't matter so much to me as long as you know how to cold read pretty well or know how to hold the script in your hand and dip down and, 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 and grab what you need from it and then come back up. There's a technique, there's a skill to that. Although I do know a lot of casting directors, British casting directors, Canadian casting directors, who absolutely insist that the actors are off book. They will usually let you know. I think it's a little bit of a burden to have actors off book because there's already a lot of fear. There's already a lot of anxiety in coming in. And then you have to get it right the very first time and be off book and audition in front of people you've maybe never have met before, it's a lot of pressure. So I tell actors, unless it's for maybe five lines or less or one page, yeah, if it's a smaller part and you only have seven, 10 lines, be off book, don't bring in a script with you. But if it's a guest lead, a lead role, three, five, seven pages long, and maybe you've had three or four other auditions that you're prepping for with other casting directors on other projects, I don't mind at all that an actor comes in with the script. Okay. It makes me feel like if they don't have the script and they blow a line four pages in, guess what? They're gonna to wanna to start over again. And I may have 30 actors waiting in the room. I will just pull my hair out, which I have now a little bit more. Right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think, oh gosh, now I've got, I'm running late, my producers need to leave, and this actor wants to start over. And sure. sometimes I'll just say, just pick it up, just pick it up from where you are. If they'd had the script in their hand as a tool, maybe a little safety net, but as a tool, use the script. So I think it, it depends, but listen to what the casting directors want. Some of them want you off book. For me personally, 
and I know actors are busy, especially during pilot season, not this one, but many, is, you know, I know you're out there a lot. So have a script with you, and if you need it, use it. There's a, there's a great conversation happening here as you're talking. There's a lot of people really engaged, and I think what you're saying is really resonating with them. I got a, I got a call out to Sadiqa, just made a comment earlier. You could feel that Sadiqa and a lot of people, they're hearing what you're talking about, and they're like, man, I, I want to get back to work. There's a lot of actors right now who, as we're talking about the craft and about you know, the, the art of this, this whole thing, you can feel that so many people are, are excited to do it. I love that you have that background as an actor yourself and as a coach. Um, I think that must really, it's why you're one of the most in-demand casting directors, and I, I really appreciate your time here. We've still got uh, about 15 more minutes left, and I've got some great questions. Um, I'd love to keep going with you here. Diana sent one over, and this was an interesting one, the gut flag. Diana wants to know, if an actor has got awards, uh, if they've been recognized maybe in shorts or at festivals, uh, maybe they've got a recommendation from casting somewhere else, would you ever take that into consideration? Would that ever inspire you perhaps to bring that particular actor in for a larger role uh, in a project, whether it was film or TV, that maybe you weren't looking at them for? Uh, how important are those things? Do you factor those kinds of things into your, into your process, Paul, as a casting director? Yes. Um, and I do go to a lot of short film festivals, um, film festivals where we want to be the first casting director that discovers this talent. So our producers, our directors, they appreciate when I tell them, hey, listen, I was at the um, Toronto Film Festival. I was at uh, a Palm Springs uh, Short Film Festival. And I saw this actor, I met this actor after the, the, um, you know, the, the screening. And I think, I, I want you to meet him because I think he'd be a really interesting or she'd be an interesting way to go. So. We do whatever we can. I do the same thing with plays. I go to see a lot of theater because it's <clears throat> a passion of mine. Of course. So, um, uh, you know, we only have so much time and we're, we, there's a lot of pressure to cast very quickly sometimes, especially in television. But I always try to leave the door open for that special actor that no one has ever heard of that came from a short film, an independent film stage that I can introduce my producers with. It makes me feel like I'm doing my job and it makes them feel like I'm digging deeper than just scratching the surface. Um, another question came in from Sam and a bunch of these very similar all came in as well. So I know this is something that a lot of the female participants are thinking about. Uh, the question is about being a female in the industry. A lot of them wear makeup. Uh, how much makeup is too much. Do you have an opinion on that? Are hair extensions or lash extensions or getting their nails done appropriate? So many things that often uh, males don't have to think or worry about at all are, are important parts for, for female actors who are wondering, what's your take on all that? Is it something you talk about or think about when they leave the room? That's a great <clears throat> question that a lot of actors have, uh, along with wardrobe and all of that. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, uh, just like your headshots, ladies, you know, uh, actresses out there try to less is more when it comes to makeup. We don't like to see a lot of jewelry. We don't like to see a lot of makeup um, uh, and a headshot. You know, I, I know we haven't really spoken too much about that and we may not have time to address that today. But in the audition room, I think the rule is the same. You know, keep it really simple. Some, you may not have sometimes the best skin. So a little bit of foundation. Because you know, when you're on screen, when you're on camera, if, if you're on set, they're gonna be making you up so that you know, we won't see those blemishes. So, but be really careful about that. Unless the role is really specific, like you're a golf girl, you know, or you've got, or there's some kind of period demand where there's a certain kind of makeup or hair demand. Keep it really simple. We just wanna see you. Let the wardrobe people, let the makeup people on set decide with the director, you know, how you're going to look on set. I would dress to suggest your character and I would have just the barest minimum of makeup. Uh, Denise says, hola, how are you, Paul? Uh, how, have you ever considered the demo reel? Let's talk about that for a second. I think it's a great question, Denise. This came up a bunch of times as well. The demo reel, uh, some actors have them, some of them put a lot of time and effort into them. Um, in what order do you prefer to see those? Um, do, do, do major networks uh, need to appear at the top in the demo? Um, so fascinated, everyone was really curious. Do they help 
Do they hurt? Uh, when do you want to see them? And what's your advice on demo reels in general, Paul? They are absolutely demo reels. Good headshots and demo reels are absolutely vital today because there's a lot of casting that's being done virtually where we may not bring you in for a role or have you self tape for a role unless we can see some work that you've already done. And these days, it's so much easier to get that. Get a minute, get two minutes, you know, 30 seconds even is enough for us to get an indication of, you know, is what's the look like on camera? Is there intelligence? Is there a sense of humor? Is, does this seem to be a physical fit perhaps for the role? So it's how we're watching so many auditions. And I know we're going to be doing more of that. So you have to be really good at not only self-taping, obviously, but you have to be, have some content. Absolutely. You must have some content. And my general advice is have your strongest work, your most recent work up front. And it doesn't necessarily matter that it may not be a network or studio film that we know about. Uh, you can do your own demo reels now through, you know, companies are doing demo reels for actors um, that aren't very expensive to do. You can pull a clip from a short film, an independent film, a student film. And as long as we get a really good indication of perhaps some range, what your look is, and there's no reason I would challenge every actor out there, if you don't have a demo reel, within six months, I challenge you to have at least 30 seconds of something that you can help pitch yourself to a casting director or an agent for. It's vital more than ever, and it's easier now than it's ever been to start putting together some content for yourself. That, that's huge, Paul. And I want to let our viewers out there know that actually on that same vein, we're going to be developing a live stream just on that topic alone on a couple of those things. I think you've touched on it. And uh, I wish we, we, we could fill a full hour on that. You, you really nailed it. Um, uh, Joe wants to know something. Uh, we're talking about self tapes and backgrounds and you brought it up, uh, referenced it earlier. Julia wants, Juliana wants to know, is there a color that is recommended or better uh, for self-tape backgrounds? Uh, she often uses a white uh, or black and green. Uh, she's alternated, but she's never sure which one she should use. Uh, is she overthinking it? Do you have an opinion? Do casting directors care? How important is that? The no, yes, thanks. Um, great question. No, you're not overthinking it. I think it's really important to have the right lighting. You know, I've got a couple of, um, umbrella lights here and a ring light. That's really all you need when I put actors on tape if I need to, or I'm coaching them and they need to make a self tape right away. That's really all I need. My background, I recommend at MGM, I had the same background for 16 years. So I saved the money on just background there. I think maybe that's the only reason my contract was renewed uh, is because I had the same sheet up there sure, all the time. Sure. Um, but it was light blue. I think light blue, a darker blue, perhaps gray. Those are usually, I find, the best backgrounds. Not black. I've never seen that. Or green, or white, especially white. Uh, another great question that came in, and there was a whole bunch of these as well. Let's talk about social media for a minute. And this is becoming more and more prevalent. You referenced earlier in the live stream uh, working with talent who who had really been sort of discovered through YouTube. Um, right now, in particular, how important is having an established social media presence uh, to an actor's career how, in terms of how you as a casting director or your, your peers will look at them? And when I say social media, let's carve that into two things. A presence, as, as, as we're being asked here, and the second part is a following. Are those things you factor in? How important is it, Paul? They are increasingly important. Producers, directors ask about them um, often. Um, it can make a difference if a particular actor, two actors come in and one has a higher profile and a higher following uh, in social media, it can tip the scale. But those are usually for, generally speaking, for some of the larger roles. And we will still go with the best actor for the role. Uh, for some of the smaller roles, it doesn't really matter for us. I think it's important, you know, we're going to hire the actor in the room. We're not going to be looking at their Twitter following for a under five role or a small role. Uh, I, I've really never seen that happening, at least in my experience. But if you're going to be doing social media, guys, and I hope you do, um, 
to an extent, just be really gracious about your social media posts. Try not to get political out there. I do, but not in my posts for the most part. I keep that in my personal world. And, and make it about the work. Make it about how, how uh, fortunate you are to work with filmmakers. You're doing this short film. You're doing this independent film. Don't make it all about you is my general advice, even though it is all about you. But you want to sort of convince us that, oh my God, what a humble, gracious, humility-filled actor who's really just, just so uh, um, blessed to do the work, just be with other working professionals and thank them for that. So that's how I would really give advice in terms Got of it. what kind of social media you have um, and how it can benefit you. Uh, I've got time for about two more here, and then I want to give a, a, a closing thought to you, of course, Paul. Uh, Paul Weber, casting director, Los Angeles-based. Uh, thanks for being on our live stream. Ask me anything today. Uh, one of the questions that came in was from Jonathan, right there in LA, next door to you probably. Uh, Jonathan says, thank you so much for doing this, Paul. This is great. Earlier, you mentioned sticking to the script when auditioning. Uh, Jonathan wants to know that if there's no specific direction in the audition, how much leeway should an actor take in making those bold decisions we talked about in an audition or the self tape? If so. specifically there's not enough direction about that character or maybe that scene, um, do you have any advice on how much leeway they have to take it for a walk and be bold? Again, I have to go back to the other answer pretty quickly yeah. is sure, sure. no matter what you have in front of you to be safe and also, uh, and I mean that in, in a way that will help you. Uh, there, there are opportunities to take risk, but if you are in the room and if you have a question about a character, ask one question maybe in the room. But, but in terms of your preparation, leave a little bit of wiggle room because you're gonna get direction and you may be given permission to, to go off script a little bit, but try to, I think it's really most important to really do the work, do the homework on the script, come on in and, and do what's on the page and then wait for a little bit of wiggle room where there might be an opportunity to, to step outside a little bit of that. You know, I always tell actors it's really important to be 100% prepared, but leave 20% for the audition gods to kind of walk through the room and inspire you because, you know, no matter how well prepared you are, things are gonna change. The winds will change in the room. So. So you will just want to be prepared for that. And that's maybe where, when you're given permission, you can step outside a little bit, take direction and take an extra risk. That's really, really great insight on there, Paul. Uh, I'm going to throw it back to you for the final thought in just a moment. But in, in closing, first, I really want to thank you again today. This has been invaluable. I want to thank everyone who logged in for the live stream. We will be doing this weekly now. This is something that we, we, we know actors have asked for, and, and we are right there on the front lines to help you have this kind of connection to casting directors and people shaping the industry as you try to shape your craft and your career. If you want to stay connected to Paul Weber, you can find him on Facebook under Paul Weber Casting. You can find him on Instagram as Paul Weber CD. You can find him on Twitter as at Paul Weber CD, or you can email him at paulwebercasting at gmail.com. But next week, our series is going to continue. We've got a blockbuster lineup too. I mean, uh, Paul, you have just kicked off what is going to be so much fun. We've got some of the biggest names in casting joining us. We're going to introduce you to some of them uh, over the weekend and announce them. And as we continue to support the industry, however we can at Casting Workbook, the first 10,000 people that register, it will be absolutely free. What we are asking is if you can, uh, on behalf of Casting Workbook and Paul Weber, we're going to make a donation to actorsfund.org today, as well as afchelps.ca. And if you can do that, uh, please, uh, whatever you can, it's always appreciated. But these live streams are going to be absolutely free uh, to the first 10,000 people. Um, Paul, this has been a lot of fun. I guess the final question is a little bit of an open one to you. And I wanted you to leave a final thought for all these actors out there uh, that are, are sitting here hanging off, uh, off your experience and your insight have you got some advice for them have you got something that they should really think about as we close the live stream today well i mean we're in sort of an unprecedented time right now which which uh, is really challenging for us not that we wouldn't be doing this otherwise but now this opportunity presents itself so i'm glad we're doing that and you know this whole crisis and even beyond this crisis um 
I always encourage actors to look, and I've said this before, um, uh, come from a position of empowerment rather than fear and victimization. And I know that's challenging to do because, you know, we're all paralyzed a little bit. And I know I felt that way. So taking an action, any action, just some small step will make you feel better. Um, and it's a gift in a way for us. So I don't want us to squander this time. Um, you know, do the things that you've procrastinated on. I know I am, you know, I'm reading that book that's been on my bookshelf for six or eight years, you know, I'm writing in a journal more. I'm, I'm developing ideas for, for stories and scripts. I'm talking, I'm, I'm interrelating and I'm, I'm connecting with friends that I haven't talked to. I'm on the phone more than I used to be. Um, I'm collaborating, you know, engaging with others, you know, on Zoom, Skype. And I, I know a lot of you guys are doing that because it's a human need to do that. Um, and I'm even spending more time just being alone which you kind of have to be in your own world a little bit, That's meditating. Right, yeah. You know, that quiet time is incredibly um, nurturing. It's not easy, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tap into that as well, too. You know, I'm finding out that I kind of like myself, even though I'm getting on my own nerds more and more every day. <laughs> I do sort of like myself, right? So I'm, I'm learning that. Um, and look, guys, you know, I think things will get, may get a little worse before they get better. Um, but it's, it's, it's our perception of what fear is and how we handle it that's gonna get us through all of this. Um, and I think we're pretty resilient creatures, especially actors can be. Um, yes, they are, they are. Yeah, you know? Yeah, we're gonna grow from this adversity and, um, and it's gonna end. But even if it's 30 days from now, think of it as a gift to do all those things or a couple of those things that you didn't have time or give yourself permission to do or were distracted from doing before. And part of it is your craft, working on your craft, uh, yeah. reading books, uh, uh, training online as much as you can. I think this is really a gift. So I would hate to see us squander this opportunity. Uh, very wise words from Paul Weber, casting director, uh, a longtime industry veteran and coach. Paul, thank you so much for doing the live stream today. Thank you, all of you at home. We will look forward to having you uh, at our next week's live stream AMA. Uh, those announcements will be coming out this weekend, so stay tuned. Paul, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time on Casting Workbooks live stream AMA. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Please stay safe and healthy, and we'll talk to you again.